Hello, welcome to our latest Linton cast. Today we have a very special guest. We have Ethan Copet, who is the product manager for the ABM HubSpot solution. And he's gonna answer some questions uh, that um, we've been interested in for a bit now about ABM, how to use it in HubSpot, how to get started. So Ethan, um, say hi and, and tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the nitty, nitty gritty here. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, sure. So my name is Ethan, everybody. And uh, like Roman said, I'm the product manager for HubSpot's ABM solution. And so for about the past year, I've been kind of uh, specking out and building this uh, ABM tool, or I guess solution, um, with about with, with a few thousand customers. So I'm really excited to, to talk to you about it. It launched back in May. Um, and yeah, looking forward to, to giving you some more info. Great. So first question is, how do people get started with uh, ABM and HubSpot? What's your, what's your recommendation here? So um, the first thing is it's actually pretty easy, which is crazy because I think that uh, ABM has become something in the market that's like really difficult to do and you have to spend a lot of money. But we really tried to do something different um, with HubSpot, HubSpot's ABM solution because ultimately like doing ABM isn't, it's not like you use a tool or something. ABM is a strategy, um, kind of like inbound. So ABM is really just the, the process of uh, sales and marketing working together to create um, a kind of relevant personalized experience for a relatively small set of target accounts. So all you really need to do to get started with HubSpot's ABM solution is pick some target accounts. Um, and you can, I, I would start with like five or 10, very small number. Um, and the way you label those target accounts is we have a little property in HubSpot CRM called target accounts. And it's a company property and you basically just said it is true so you can go in and like you know select whichever companies you want and pick target account equals true and then um you get access to all of these out of the box great features like we have some uh, out of the box reporting we you can use we have kind of a new command center for you to look at these target accounts um so what all you have to do is select the target accounts and kind of a lot of the work of getting started is actually done for you by us now we expect you to kind of customize a lot of that reporting and stuff like that as you uh, need but most of the work should be done for you. All right, great. So let's say somebody gets started, they're working uh, within uh, ABM. What are some of the things that they need to think about or what are some of the things that they should be doing as they grow in the use of, of ABM? Well, so, you know, once you get started, um, I would say you're only kind of two fifths of the way through your journey. Um, which is good, like, you know, you, you started really quickly, but there's lots of other things that you have to do. So, you know, let's say you picked five target accounts. Um, and these could be five uh, companies you really want to close because, um, you know, you need that legitimacy in a certain sort of market, or they could be five companies that are, you're actually already selling to, but you feel like things could be moving more quickly. Maybe if marketing was, you know, uh, kind of supporting the sales team and, and feeding um, really targeted content to those uh, companies over ads or email. So you've got your five companies. The next thing you should really do is um, create a basic account plan, like work with, you know, sales and marketing need to work together and kind of just create it. It could be short, like it can be half a page where they just talk about like, what are we going to do working together to help this company understand why they should buy our product? Um, so they should get aligned around, around messaging and maybe like what sort of content is going to be created. Um, and make sure that's available to everybody. Like, you know, some customers pin it as a note on, on a, a company record in the CRM. Some people have Google Docs. Um, really anything that just helps both teams have access. Um, and then after you've created a simple account plan for each one of your target accounts, you're going to want to kind of distribute that content along different sorts of channels. So maybe, you know, the sales team is um, feeding special content to different uh, contacts at that company, maybe based on their buying role, like the decision maker gets one set of content, whereas the influencer gets another sort of content. And the salesperson is doing that through sequences or through uh, in mail over LinkedIn. Um, you might have the, the marketing team who's kind of doing a similar thing, but they're doing it over um, like automated email or through ads. So you're distributing that content along different sorts of channels. Uh, and then at the end, you're going to kind of want to map who that buying committee is. So as contacts start to come in, they're engaging with your content, you want to make sure you understand like what role different contacts play in the sales process so that you can feed them the relevant content. Like a decision maker or a budget holder might have different concerns and have different um, value propositions that they need to understand versus somebody who's like an end, end user or an influencer. So you want to make sure you're really mapping that buying committee and making sure that uh, everybody is aware of who those people are. And you can use our default buying role 
property to do that. Uh, and then once you do that, you close the deal and you kind of look at what worked and what didn't work and iterate your strategy accordingly. Right. Do it all over again. That's great. Exactly. It's an iterative um, process. It's a lot like a, like a, like an engineering sprint, kind of like the agile methodology. I like that. Definitely yeah. That's a, that's, forget it. that's a good, uh, uh, that's a good analogy. So, you know, we talked about this previously when you and I just talked, um, but talk about ABM and B2B, because I think that there is some confusion because some people think, well, we're B2B, we're not, we don't need to be focused on ABM, and vice versa. So, so talk about that, um, that sort of nuance there. Yeah, so I think that uh, this is confusing for a lot of people. And the way I would think about it is like B2B is a really big category, right? B2B is just every business that sells to another business. HubSpot yep. is B2B, your B2B. Um, and the vast majority of HubSpot's customers, for example, are B2B. They sell to other businesses versus selling to, to consumers. Um, and so, so B2B is like this big spectrum. And, and the spectrum, I think, is really defined by who those customers are. So on the one end of the spectrum, you might have, you know, um, you're selling like really small deals to really small businesses. Maybe they're spending 10 or $15 a month on something, um, or maybe something is free, like a Dropbox or a Zoom or a Google Drive or a Zapier. Like those are all kind of smaller, more transactional deals. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got like, you know, Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Rapid7 right. and like Dell, who's selling like multi million dollar server infrastructure projects. So there's this spectrum. And ABM is really the toolkit that you should be thinking about when you're kind of in the middle to the high end of that spectrum. Like HPE yeah. should definitely be thinking about doing ABM, but so should anybody who has a deal where there's, you know, three or more stakeholders involved in making that decision. Um, and I think kind of the funny thing is actually a lot of businesses are gonna be doing ABM and they're gonna be doing a more volume-based approach too. Like HubSpot's a good example. On the one hand, we do you know very small transactional deals because we have a freemium motion, but we also do extremely expensive and complicated deals. And so that's where we might employ more of an ABM approach. So uh, a single business can also have multiple go-to-market motions as well. Like it's not like you have to be one or the other. So, right, that's so great It's point. a tool in your toolkit. Yeah, great point. So last question, I know we try to keep these videos uh, kind of short um, and bite-sized as they say, but what's the, what's the big mistake that you see people making with ABM? Like that you see them, you, you, you kind of maybe look back and reflect on an implementation or um, a use case or something like that. And you're like, oh, that, that, that is the, the classic um, error that we see people making. Can, do, do you have something that you can point to there? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think the, the number one thing I see it, it's like, you know, it's like there's one thing that everybody does wrong and then there's like lots of little things that sometimes happen. But the one big thing is that almost everybody who does ABM for the first time, uh, including like, you know, Terminus is kind of the, the godfather of ABM. I, I just finished their, their new book and Terminus did this. Um, this is a huge, we, like HubSpot did this. This is a mistake that everybody starting ABM for the first time makes. And that is that they pick too many target accounts. Uh, so I right. think that the yeah. thing that every, like human beings are I think naturally optimistic creatures and that's fantastic. Like, you know, nobody who's setting out to, to like put on some muscle or to lose some weight or something says like, I'm gonna set a really smart, realistic, achievable right. goal that's bite sized No one I mean, says you, that. I'm gonna lose half a pound in one year and I know I can do it, right? Yeah, no one says that. <laughs> and I think that uh, it's the same thing with ABM, right? Like we think about like, you know, hey, like, uh, are, are there some businesses that we'd really like to close? And it's like, yeah, there's 500 businesses we'd really like to close. And it's like, <laughs> right, right. right. Um, I, I think the one thing, if you, if you want to start smart, um, I think it really pays off to start off with like 10 or 15 or 25 or five target accounts, like double digits in the, at the low end. I right. heavily recommend that. Like HubSpot, when we first started doing ABM, we started off with like 10,000 target accounts because we're a huge business. <laughs> right. Um, right. But that didn't work out. And now that we're refreshing our strategy, we're starting off with like below a hundred. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's the number one thing I'd say is start with, start with 10 target accounts uh, and, and kind of get your strategy right and learn with just 10 target accounts, because then the learnings that you, you get from that, you can, you, you can scale your program out later and you can apply those learnings, but it's so much less expensive from a time and money perspective to learn something with 10 target accounts than it is to learn it with a hundred target accounts. Um, and you may feel if you do it, if you kind of bite off more than you can chew, you may feel it's not right for you when in fact it was, it's just, you were never able to kind of 
learn and see value because you were you were drowned out with all this noise. Right, right, makes sense. All right, great stuff, Ethan. Appreciate it. We're gonna drop some stuff, uh, some links in um, underneath the video. And if you like the video, let us know. We're we're talking about potentially doing a, a webinar on ABM. So let us know. We want to get you the information that you need to use um, the solution as effectively as, as you possibly can. So thanks, Ian. Um, appreciate the time. And hopefully we'll connect again on a webinar or, or something similar. All right. Good to talk to you, Robert.